I'm always tempted not after that to just say Amen. That's a sermon on its own. Thank you. Thank you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my rock, my foundation, my tomorrow. Amen. I believe on the third day he rose again from the dead. In the reading part that we had this afternoon, we read of Paul who says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one day, one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. What a tragedy. In a touching letter published in the Korea Herald, Seoul National University professor Kim Sung Kon writes, Dear young students under the sea, please forgive us for not being able to rescue you from the ill-fated ferry Seoul. As you have found out by now, we adults are so incredibly incompetent and irresponsible that you cannot count on us in times of emergency. When the disaster happened, we were hopelessly sloppy in the rescue mission, press releases and broadcasting. We were flustered by the wrong information about the passengers. Dear young students under the sea, we adults are grief-stricken and will suffer an unmitigated sense of guilt for the rest of our lives. He may not be with us anymore, but surely he will live in our hearts in the years to come. In the wake of such grief and pain, what can words do? Even the most comforting and eloquent sermon cannot really bring consolation to families and loved ones who went through hell these past days. I will not even be so presumptuous as to try and imagine the sheer helplessness and powerlessness they have felt, not to mention the ones who suffered in the cold ocean. And all of this brings us to a most uncomfortable question. Let's be brave. Let's ask the question. Let's whisper the question, where was God? Did he allow it? Was there some kind of onlooking, too powerless to act or to intervene? This is not only a question that we might ask here, even whisper the question, but that's a question that was asked for many, many years, for many centuries. In theology, we do like to give questions names, big names. So they call this question the Theodicea question. The Theodicea question actually boils down to this. Why does a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? They ask it in the Holocaust. 
after 911, they ask that. The survivors of the North Korean gulags ask that. And 2,000 years ago, on a cross, stinking, rough cross, the Son of God also asked it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? Well, this term was coined in 1710, but it's an old question. Where was God? You know, sometimes I wonder what it is to be God. Maybe you ask the question. If you were God, you witnessed the symphony of light from a billion galaxies as they soar through endless space. If you are God, you are surrounded by angelic choirs and the voices of praise from whatever corner of the universe that envelop your throne. If you are God, I just wonder. A week or two ago, there was a day when God witnessed more than 300 people brutally taken as a ship sank and the entire nation was hurled into a state of shock and disbelief. What would it have been like to be God that day? And to be honest, I don't know. I don't know what it feels like to be God. To be more honest, the theodicy question, I have no idea. But a father whose son or daughter, or a mother whose son or daughter is trapped inside a steel coffin slowly sinking to the bottom of the sea, have little interest in philosophical questions. I know one thing. I know that we live in a very broken world. We live in a world where there are disasters. We live in a world where people get sick. We live in a world where there are accidents. We live in a world where young people die and old people die. We live in a world that is broken, where injustice happens. I don't understand it. I don't understand that millions of children will die in the next week of hunger. I don't understand how an airplane can disappear. I really don't understand why there's suffering and brokenness. I don't like it. Moreover, I really hate it. But in in the midst of this all and this very dark picture, there's hope. There's always hope. And that keeps us going. That brings me back to Paul in his letter to the small congregation of Philippi. You see, this letter as we have seen during the past few weeks in the morning services and few here, is embedded in crisis. Maybe not a sinking ship, but for them, the ship was sinking. For them, their lives were sinking and fast. And around them, it was just darkness. And in this time, Not only their ship was sinking, but Paul's ship was also sinking. He didn't know what is going to happen. Paul is in a crisis, so the church. And when someone is facing crisis 
or suffering. And he starts to think about his anchors and about his foundations. It's a time to check the foundations. Am I standing? Will I survive this? Paul is doing just that. He's taking stock of his life, the profits and the losses. And therefore, he comes to the, the seventh verse, verse 7 to 9. The very credentials. These people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash. Along with everything else, I used to take credit for, and why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone out of my life. In a time of crisis, you get to the bare essentials. He uses two words. He's weighing. The one word is kardos. The other word is zemia. And he's weighing, he's using the scale. What are the profits of my life? What is weighing the most? And then he says, well, I've got something that weighs, outweighs anything else. And that is Christ. And then he goes on and talk about Christ. Christ and his suffering, Christ and his resurrection. He says, I want to come into this life of resurrection. I want to live a resurrected life. The others are lost. The others are losses. My daughter Lelani and she is the most beautiful girl in the whole world. But she had a love for Barbie dolls. Now, our house, there she is. You can see she looks just like me. Okay. But there she is. And she loved Barbie dolls. Since she was a little, little girl, if we go to shop, what do you want? Barbie dolls. And it, and it had to be the genuine ones, she could spot a fake from a distance. So her whole room was full of Barbies. Every birthday, every Christmas, everyone knew Leilani wants Barbies, and everyone bought Barbies. She had fat Barbies, she had uh, less fat Barbies. She had all kinds of Barbies. They were her prize collection. Each with their own name, cared for and loved for. And one day, I saw her with a big box. I asked her, what, what's going on? And she said, watch. And I watched. She went up to her room, and then at some point she called me. She said, come. I said, what are you doing? She said, well... There they are, all the Barbies in one box. And I said, okay, what, what now? She said, take this and give it to someone. Go give it to charity or whatever. I said, Lelani, do you know what you're doing? Yes. And then she said to me, I'm over them. I'm over them. I had outgrown them. I've got better things. And this is what Paul says. I'm over those things of the past. I'm over those things that were so important to me. Do you know what is important to me? To me, it's important to live Christ. I have found Christ. Why? Paul, you in the prison. Philippi, well... You're nearly there. He says, I reckon all things as pure lust. Why? Because of Christ. 
I want to experience Christ. And I know that Christ is the one who would take me through this. And he is the one after this. His resurrection tells me that death is conquered. The final enemy has been defeated. There is a tomorrow. This is what he's after. He's stretching them out. If this is true, if Christ has risen from the dead, if that is true, then this is just a bridge. It's not the end. There's a tomorrow. And that tomorrow is Christ. In Christ, there is the tomorrow power, the tomorrow energy, the tomorrow hope. And Paul's hope is anchored. He builds his life. He bets his life on the resurrection of Christ. It's a guarantee that this life is worth living and saving but it's also the guarantee that if suffering happens, if disaster comes, he says, there's something more. Coming back to what we're talking about, the why question, I don't know. I'm not going to even try to answer that. God knows. But what I know is this, that in our troubles, if we live this resurrected life, if that is true, and I believe with my whole heart it is true, Christ has risen, then I know that wherever there is calamity, He is with us in it. He's suffering with us. He's there. But the thing that gives us hope is that that is not the end. There's more. I know God is not Superman. Many people call on God and say, well, he's Superman. He should come when I click my fingers. And he should come flying down the alley and do whatever Superman does best. God's not Superman. He's not Mr. America. The movie that's now on. He's not that Savior. He's God. When I visited New York shortly after 911, I was stunned when there was a cross right in the middle of the rubble. It was found by a fireman. When he found it, his words were, God was here. Viktor Frankl, when he was in prison, he says, well, God was here. In the hall of the ship, in the darkness of the cold water, God was there. And one day when we cross the river, he'll be there. Because Jesus has risen. I want to close with a story. He was 27 years old, a champion tennis star, young, handsome, fit, the only son of very successful parents. And yesterday, 10 years ago, Mariki's phone rang. She and Johan was in a shop and they were preparing for holiday. And a call came that changed their lives. 
even his tent. The unbelief, the shock, the utter devastation that followed the call were indescribable. The night when they collected his ashes, they put it, it on a little table with two candles, with his photo, and I sat with them. And we, we had a nice talk. They told me about him, about how they feel. And then at some point, she said something that will stay with me my whole life. She said, do you know what? The resurrection. I have to believe in the resurrection. That's my hope. I believe in the resurrection. I believe and that one day that I will meet him again. And as a mother, she says, that's my hope in Christ. So brothers and sisters, Jesus has risen. He has risen indeed. I would like you to do something that we don't always do. I would like you to turn to the person next to you or person close to you and just say to that person, you will rise again. Will you do that? You will rise again. Amen.